Hi class, we're walking through independent samples and how to perform them in SPSS. So I've mentioned before that I was going to show you how to take data from Excel, pull it in directly to SPSS. So here I have an Excel spreadsheet with the data for the independent samples example. And you can see that I have it set up where I have the group on column A, and these are ones and twos. And then I have the scores over here. And so these individuals, we're looking at memory scores and we're looking to see between these two groups, one receiving the control, so it's just they're not getting any treatment, and then the other one receiving the treatment, are they going to see a difference in their memories after a month of being treated? So I have the data set up in Excel. I don't have to have the Excel file open for SPSS to open it, but I wanted to show you what the file looks like before we move into SPSS. So in SPSS, when it opens, you can elect to have it open a file, the data from a file. But I've already opened it so that I can show you how to open data when you're in it. If you go to File, Open, Data, it opens a browser so that you can select where your data is stored. My data is stored in the folder for this class under in-class exercises. And it defaults to look for SPS files. So you're looking for an SPSS file, but our data is in Excel. We need to change that. So now you see that it expands. It adds some additional files over here. And then I'm using the in-class exercise 11 data. You will have to create this data file. So I'm not going to provide it to you. Part of that is so that you get used to formatting the data correctly. Knowing how to format, for instance, data that's dependent samples versus independent samples is important. And I'm going to click open on this and I'll go back to the data file and show you. When we did the dependent samples design, we had a score here and it said score one or score time one. And then we had a score right beside it. And so we had the same individual under two different circumstances, two different conditions. So we want one person per row. And we want all their data on the same row. So even if I had other things like their gender, so let's kind of set it up. If I was doing dependent, I'd have score two. And then I might have the individual's gender. I might have their age. And I would have everything right together for that person. And so when I do an independent samples design though, I might would still have gender and age out here. I don't have a score two because we only have one score per person on the dependent variable of interest. The second, what we're comparing to our group two, in this case, they are two completely different groups, two completely different samples. They're not connected, they're not matched, they're not paired on anything. We don't have a repeated measures design. So we have to have an individual row for each score because we don't have two scores for any person. So you do need to practice doing those things because one day when you're working with your own data or creating real data, you're gonna have to know how to set those things up. So this gives you an opportunity to practice that. So from this, I can see that SPSS is trying to pull in that data file that I'd already created. And it defaults to read the variable name from the first row, that works for me because my first row does in fact have the variable names, group and score. It looks like maybe there was some data in on the right hand side in that file earlier because it's trying to pick up on something, but you can see from just the dots being in here that there's really no data. We'll get rid of those columns here in a moment. So I'm gonna click okay because it looks like it's pulling in everything basically as I would want it to. So as I mentioned, at some point there may have been something in these cells on the right hand side, and it's just giving a default label to those columns, V3, V4, V standing for variable. If I go into the variable view, I can then get rid of these. So I can click on the top one. I can 
move those around if I wanted to change the order. In this case, I want to get rid of all of them. So I'm going to click on the top one. I'm going to hit Shift, click on the bottom one. It'll highlight all of them. And then I can right click and just clear all of those. So now I don't have those additional variables. This makes it easier if I want to add another variable later. So I don't have something in between my variables. It can make it hard to see the variables that I'm interested in. Under variable view, we do have two groups. So we could go in and specify group one is our control and group two is our experimental. This will just make our output a little bit easier to read, a little bit easier to interpret and understand, especially useful if we're providing this output to somebody else. But even for ourselves, if I come back to this data six months, a year later, sometimes even just tomorrow, I may forget what I coded one and what I coded two, so it's useful to have that there. It did pick up that this is a grouping variable. It's nominal. We have two groups, and it picked up that the score is scale or continuous, so all of that is set up and set up appropriately. An important part of independent samples t-test that we haven't had to do before is looking at that homogeneity of variance. So if I go in to data, I can split the file and I'm going to split on group and I am going to organize the output by groups and then I'm going to click OK. And then what I'm going to do first is run a histogram. And in fact, let's do it all together. So I'm going to run frequencies for the score. I don't actually want the frequency table though. Might as well go ahead and get mean, median. We can get the min, max, genus, kurtosis. Click continue and then I'm going to do histograms. This will allow us to visually look at that variability for the control condition and the experimental. What we're ideally wanting to see with homogeneity of variance is that the variability looks similar between these two groups. So in the histogram, we can see that the scores are ranging from somewhere like 57 to about 75. So that's a little under a 20 point range. And we could always request the range and see it would pop up here. So for this group though, it's 58 to 74. And then we could look at the range for that. Skewness, kurtosis, neither one of them look problematic. If I take skewness divided by the standard error of skewness, it's going to give me about one. If I take kurtosis divided by the standard error of kurtosis, it's going to give me actually uh, considerably less than one. So somewhere in the neighborhood of 0.3, give or take. And of course, if I was really reporting it, I would actually do it. But if I'm just looking to see is skewness kurtosis a problem? I can just kind of quickly glance at those. So I see that the mean for this group is 64.6, the median 64.5. The fact that they're relatively close to each other would also give me some indicator that it may be a normal distribution because in a normal distribution, they should be equal to each other. And importantly, standard deviation is 4.122. So now if I scroll down for the second group, this is the experimental group, I see that the standard deviation is a little bit less. That would suggest that the first group perhaps has a little more variability than the second group. And so when I look at this, I can see the range is 62 to 76. So, you know, a little bit lower, a little bit less variability possibly. The range and the standard deviation would both suggest that. The actual test is based on the variance and the test will be included in the independent samples t-test. So let's go ahead and do that and then see the formal test about the equality of variance. So let's go to compare means, go down to independent samples t-test. Our grouping variable is simply labeled group. We do need to specify that our labels for that are one and two. We can click continue there and then we're going to test the score on that variable 
Our alpha, we'll leave our alpha as 0 0.05, so our confidence interval will be 95%. And we'll click continue and OK. Now what this shows me is I get a warning back because I had split the file in order to see the output for the experimental group and the control group separately, I have to go back and turn that off. So I'm going to go back into data, go to split file, and I can just say analyze all cases, do not create groups. Another way, and you would just hit OK. Another way to do that is if I go in file, new, and syntax, this allows me to write the code, and simply the code for this is split, file, off with a period. If I run that line of code, I'll see the command down here. That's all that it would have done for you. So it's an easy, quick introduction to syntax. I don't, I'm, we're not going to use syntax a lot, but I do want you to know that there are some things that you can only accomplish with syntax. You can, in fact, turn the split file off without syntax, but it's good to begin to know that, and then you can build on that knowledge in a later course if you decide to. So now the split file is off. And because of that, if I run this analysis again, go to compare means, independent samples T, it remembers everything I did just a moment ago. So I can just hit OK again. And now it actually runs it, runs it correctly. So if you get this error, it's not uncommon, especially if you're doing t-test or ANOVA, you often split the file so that you can look at variability statistics by group. And so those descriptive statistics by group are often important. We do need to look at them. We do want to see histograms by group because the overall distribution could be normal. That doesn't mean that the distribution is normal by group. And it's about error. It's about the distribution of error being normal. Well, if I split it by group, my best guess for this group is the mean for that group, which is 64.6, right? So my best guess for this group is this. Well, all the scores around that, that is the error. That is variability in this model that I cannot explain. I can't explain why this person happened to get a 74 and why this person got a 58. I can, based on this model, ex explain why the group had a 64, right? And 64.6, and that's based on the group average. So the group average represents this variability that I can present from this model, that I can derive from this model. Similarly, this group, my best guess for an in individual in this group is 68.15. Well, some people are going to score above that. Some people are going to score below that. I can't explain why they're doing better or worse from this model. What I can tell you is that the individuals in this group, group two, the experimental group, on average are performing better. Is it significantly better? We're going to check that. That's where the t-test comes in. So again, the reason we need to split it is because really we're worried about is the error, is the variability that's not explained by our model normally distributed? Well, if I do the histogram by group, the group mean is basically representing the variability explained by the model and any scores above or below it, that's variability, that's error that I cannot explain from this model. So we're going to scroll down. We can see the mean standard deviation, those coincide with what we saw earlier. And then once we get past those descriptives, we can see this Levine's test for equality of variances. That is your homogeneity of variance test. And as we kind of got a sense, the variability in the first group and the second group were relatively equal. And so this is not significant. I use a more conservative estimate of violating this assumption. So I tend to use a cutoff, an alpha level of 0.1 whenever I'm doing this type of thing. Because if I violated it, then I want to begin to explore, okay, if I do this a different way that better accommodates a lack of homogeneity of variance, will I get a different outcome? You, Many people still just use 0.05 for that, but 
you basically, it's like every other test that we've done. So it's based on the F distribution. We'll talk more about the F distribution when we talk about ANOVA, but you can see that the F obtained is relatively small. Importantly, our significance is nowhere near 0.1 or 0.05. Thus, we fail to reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis being that they are equal. So we can then, because of that, use this top row where equal variances are assumed. The bottom row is equal variances aren't assumed. So this is Welch's T, which is a slightly different test. So we're going to use the top row because we haven't violated that assumption. We find that our T obtained is negative 2.81 if we're rounding to two decimal places. Degrees of freedom is 38. We've talked about it before. That degrees of freedom is coming from N for group one minus one. That N is 20. So we end up with 19 degrees of freedom from the first group, 19 degrees of freedom from the second group, because it's N for group two minus one, and then we add those together. So another way of thinking of that is big N, which in this case would be 40, the total number of scores, minus two, because we have to calculate a mean for group one and a mean for group two, we end up losing two degrees of freedom because of that design. Our significance, we see that it's 0 0.008. Now this is two tailed. If I wanted to move it to one tail, I would then just divide by two. So 0 0.008 divided by two. The one tailed significance is P equals 0 0.004. And so I could change this label here. Make it P. This would be one tailed, and then I can change this value. And technically, it's not really 0 0.008. I'm not going to try to do that math in my head, but it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 0 0.004. And of course, if we were really reporting these results, we should be more specific. The mean difference, that's the difference from group one to group two. Standard error of the difference, that allows us to then derive the lower and upper limit of the confidence interval. And importantly, when we look at that, we see that the lower limit is negative 6.109. The upper limit is negative 0.991. It does not contain zero in the confidence interval. Thus, if our question is a two-tailed question of, is there a difference between the control condition and the experimental condition? Well, if there's a difference, then zero should not be a likely difference. Zero would indicate there is no difference. We find that zero is not in the range of scores. The upper limit is still below zero. More specifically, if we had a one-tailed hypothesis, we see that when we look at this, group two or experimental group is performing significantly better, higher than group one, where their mean is 64.6 and the experimental group is 68.15. So when we go from time one to, or control condition to experimental, we are seeing a increase and thus our difference from the control condition to the experimental. If I subtract the mean of the experimental group from the control group, I'm gonna get a negative difference of negative 3.55 and the confidence interval around that difference is not going to have zero in the confidence interval. It's still going to be below zero at the upper limit. And so we may not find a difference of negative 3.55 if we did this again with two new samples of individuals and gave another group this drug, but we would expect that there is some improvement between the control condition and the experimental condition with the experimental condition doing better. And they could do even better than negative 3.55. They could likely have a difference of negative 6.1 and possibly they could not do quite as well. The upper limit would be a little more than negative one, negative 0.99, still though doesn't include zero. So if we sampled again, we would expect that we would find a difference Thus, it does seem that this drug is helping these individuals, helping to improve their memory performance.